Volume One, Chapter Fifteen of Emma, by Jane Austen, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Mister Woodhouse was soon ready for his tea, and when he had drank his tea, he was quite ready to go home. And it was as much as his three companions could do to entertain away his notice of the lateness of the hour before the other gentlemen appeared. Mr. Weston was chatty and convivial, and no friend to early separations of any sort. But at last the drawing-room party did receive an augmentation. Mr. Elton, in very good spirits, was one of the first to walk in. Mrs. Weston and Emma were sitting together on a sofa. He joined them immediately, and with scarcely an invitation, seated himself between them. Emma, in good spirits too, from the amusement afforded her mind by the expectation of Mr. Frank Churchill. Was willing to forget his late improprieties, and be as well satisfied with him as before, and on his making Harriet his very first subject, was ready to listen with most friendly smiles. He professed himself extremely anxious about her fair friend, her fair, lovely, amiable friend. Did she know? Had she heard anything about her since their being at Randalls? He felt much anxiety. He must confess that the nature of her complaint alarmed him considerably. And in this style he talked on for some time very properly, not much attending to any answer, but altogether sufficiently awake to the terror of a bad sore throat, and Emma was quite in charity with him. But at last there seemed a more perverse turn. It seemed all at once as if he were more afraid of its being a bad sore throat on her account than on Harriet's, more anxious that she should escape the infection, than that there should be no infection in the complaint. He began with great eagerness to entreat her to refrain from visiting the sick chamber again for the present, to entreat her to promise him not to venture into such hazard till he had seen Mr. Perry and learnt his opinion. And though she tried to laugh it off and bring the subject back to its proper course, there was no putting an end to his extreme solicitude about her. She was vexed. It did appear there was no concealing it exactly like the pretence of being in love with her instead of of Harriet. An inconstancy, if real, the most contemptible and abominable, as she had difficulty in behaving with temper. He turned to Mrs. Weston to implore her assistance. Would she not give him her support? Would not she add her persuasions to his to induce Miss Woodhouse not to go to Mrs. Goddard's till it were certain that Miss Smith's disorder had no infection? He could not be satisfied without a promise. Would she not give him her influence in procuring it? So scrupulous for others, he continued, and yet so careless for herself. She wanted me to nurse my cold by staying at home today, and yet will not promise to avoid the danger of catching an ulcerated sore throat herself. Is this fair, Mrs. Weston? Judge between us. Have not I some right to complain? I am sure of your kind support and aid. Emma saw Mrs. Weston's surprise and felt that it must be great at an address which, in words and manner, was assuming to himself the right of first interest in her. And as for herself, she was too much provoked and offended to have the power of directly saying anything to the purpose. She could only give him a look, but it was such a look as she thought must restore him to his senses, and then left the sofa, removing to a seat by her sister and giving her all her attention. She had not time to know how Mr. Elton took the reproof. So rapidly did another subject succeed, for Mr. John Knightley now came into the room from examining the weather and opened on them with all the information of the ground being covered with snow, and of it still snowing fast with a strong drifting wind. Concluding with these words to Mr. Woodhouse, "This will prove a spirited beginning of your winter engagements, sir. Something new for your coachman and horses to be making their way through a storm of snow." Poor Mr. Woodhouse was silent from consternation, but everybody else had something to say. Everybody was either surprised or not surprised, and had some question to ask or some comfort to offer. Mrs. Weston and Emma tried earnestly to cheer him and turn his attention from his son-in-law, who was pursuing his triumph rather unfeelingly. "I admired your resolution very much, sir," said he, "in venturing out in such weather, for of course you saw there would be snow very soon. Everybody must have seen the snow coming on." I admired your spirit, and I dare say we shall get home very well. Another hour or two snow can hardly make the road impassable, and we are two carriages. If one is blown over in the bleak part of the common field, there will be another at hand. I dare say we shall all be safe at Hartfield before midnight. Mister Weston, with a triumph of a different sort, was confessing that he had known it to be snowing some time, but had not said a word, lest it should make Mister Woodhouse uncomfortable and be an excuse for his hurrying away. As to there being any quantity of snow fallen or likely to fall to impede their return, that was a mere joke. He was afraid they would find no difficulty. 
He wished the road might be impassable, that he might be able to keep them all at Randall's, and with the utmost good will was sure that accommodation might be found for everybody, calling on his wife to agree with him, that with a little contrivance everybody might be lodged, which she hardly knew how to do, from the consciousness of there being but two spare rooms in the house. "'What is to be done, my dear Emma, what is to be done?' was Mr. Woodhouse's first exclamation, and all that he could say for some time. To her he looked for comfort, and her assurances of safety, her representation of the excellence of the horses, and of James, and of their having so many friends about them, revived him a little. His eldest daughter's alarm was equal to his own. The horror of being blocked up at Randall's, while her children were at Hartfield, was full in her imagination, and fancying the road to be just now passable for adventurous people, but in a state that admitted no delay, she was eager to have it settled, that her father and Emma should remain at Randall's, while she and her husband set forward instantly through all the possible accumulations of drifted snow that might impede them. "'You had better order the carriage directly, my love,' said she. "'I dare say we shall be able to get along if we set off directly, and if we do come to anything very bad, I can get out and walk. I am not at all afraid. I should not mind walking half the way. I could change my shoes, you know, the moment I got home, and it is not the sort of thing that gives me cold.' "'Indeed,' replied he, "'then, my dear Isabella, it is the most extraordinary sort of thing in the world, for in general everything does give you cold. Walk home! You are prettily shod for walking home, I dare say. It will be bad enough for the horses." Isabella turned to Mrs. Weston for her approbation of the plan. Mrs. Weston could only approve. Isabella then went to Emma, but Emma could not so entirely give up the hope of their being all able to get away, and they were still discussing the point, when Mr. Knightley, who had left the room immediately after his brother's first report of the snow, came back again, and told them that he had been out of doors to examine, and could answer for there being not the smallest difficulty in their getting home, whenever they liked, either now or an hour hence. He had gone beyond the sweep, some way along the Highbury Road. The snow was nowhere above a half an inch deep, in many places hardly enough to whiten the ground. A very few flakes were falling at present, but the clouds were parting, and there was every appearance of its being soon over. He had seen the coachman, and they both agreed with him in there being nothing to apprehend. To Isabella the relief of such tidings was very great, and they were scarcely less acceptable to Emma on her father's account, who was immediately set as much at ease on the subject as his nervous constitution allowed. But the alarm that had been raised could not be appeased so as to admit of any comfort for him while he continued at Randall's. He was satisfied of there being no present danger in returning home, but no assurances could convince him that it was safe to stay and while the others were variously urging and recommending, Mr. Knightley and Emma settled it in a few brief sentences, thus, "'Your father will not be easy. Why do you not go?' "'I am ready, if the others are. Shall I ring the bell?' "'Yes, do.' And the bell was rung, and the carriage is spoken for. A few minutes more, and Emma hoped to see one troublesome companion deposited in his own house, to get sober and cool, and the other recover his temper and happiness when this visit of hardship were over.' 